Tonight, Marie-Julie Jaini and the secrets about the church. Don't go away. Hello everyone, I'm Monique and this is Secrets from the Vatican Archives. Joining me tonight, we have Xavier Reyes Eral, who is the Vatican detective and author extraordinaire of the recently published book, uh, Revelations. And it's about, well, it concerns, if you love Our Lady and you love to read about the messages of Our Lady, this is the book par excellence. It isn't like any other book. It contains, it is the only book that contains the secrets that were suppressed by the Vatican concerning these messages. And so, bonjour Xavier, thank you for joining us tonight. Bonjour Monique, how are you? Very well, thank you. So as always, we'd like to start with a prayer. If you'd like to start us off, Xavier. Certainly. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Oh, Father, may I pray it in Latin? Would that be all right? That would be awesome. Yes, please. Pater Noster, qui es in celis, sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, secut in celo et in terra. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Xavier. So last week, we spoke quite in detail about military affairs, how we spoke about the great French monarch and his plans for uh, to rescue Europe. It's quite remarkable, in fact, that our Lord would give such detailed information to such a simple and humble woman of a young age. Is it not? I mean... Extraordinary. Extraordinary. And to a person who gave herself so fully, uh, body and soul to God. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, these particular messages of Marie-Julie Jani, and uh, I address myself with a great gravité uh, to your uh, auditors. To the viewers. Uh, this is truly not just uh, a show of sensationalism. This is a serious call, a message that is meant for all of you and for a great deal more to hear, to read. Um, this matter is of uh, the utmost gravity. Uh, the Virgin Mary, or rather heaven, through its first emissary, the Blessed Virgin Mary, is sending an urgent urgent message to the world in which we are living right now, this particular era, which is right now subject to such a great threat, a physical threat, a geopolitical threat, and most of all, a spiritual threat. Mm -hmm. Beginning as I, as I always do, I will always uh, have a memory, a thought of my Father René Laurentin, who always whenever he was invited to make speeches, talks, or um, video presentations of sorts, always brought to the attention of his auditors that the greatest importance of these messages is not the prophetic aspect of it all, although it has mm -hmm. a tremendous weight and a tremendous importance. But the most important part of the message that the Blessed Virgin Mary through Marie-Julie Jani in La Frode the chapter which we are going into today, or whether it is in Fatima or in Akita, wherever the Blessed Virgin Mary has been recognized as sent from heaven, mm -hmm. cornerstone of a message, or rather of heaven's message, is one of urgent conversion through the sacraments of the Catholic Church. The heaven, God, is asking every man to convert to the Roman Catholic faith to received Catholic baptism, 
to prepare for the First Communion, to go to Mass every single solitary day. And, if possible, if not at least every Sunday. It is imperative. And to go to confession as often as you can. Preferably once a week, once a month, I beg your pardon. No. The message of the Virgin Mary from Marie Julie Janine tonight is going to dedicate itself to a very grave matter. And this matter concerns the Roman Catholic Church, a subject which the Catholic Church has tried through, for instance, the apparitions of La Salette, the apparitions of Fatima, and indirectly through the apparitions of um, Marie-Julie Janine Lafrotte in Brittany, to keep um, in the shadows, to keep in the darkness, so as not to attract attention, so as people not to perhaps misjudge or concentrate on something that would put the church, clergy, or Rome under a bad light. Mm -hmm. Notwithstanding, heaven is not condemning or pointing fingers to the Catholic Church. The message that we will talk tonight, Monique and I, are indeed of the utmost gravity. But before proceeding, it is important to remember that the principal message of heaven is to remain faithful to the Catholic Church. There is today indeed a civil war, but those who will leave the ship uh, of the Catholic Church must not be us. It must be all the enemies of Christ. For indeed, one of the principal messages of the Blessed Virgin Mary is that the Church has been indeed infiltrated. Mm -hmm. Same messages has been echoed, not just in La Fraude, but in La Salette, in places like Akita, certainly in Fatima, and in other places. I call all your editors, your viewers, your auditors, to go into the internet when you have a chance and look and read the story of a lady of good success, by the way, whose story is likewise in this book. Extraordinary. All these particular apparitions, whether in Ecuador in the 17th century or in Akita in the late 70s, uh, 1970s, early 1980s, Fatima, 1917, La Salette, 1846, La Fraude, from 1873 all the way to 1941, make a great mosaic, a great picture. Those apparitions are complementary to each other, but they all orbit around one same message, loyalty to the church, Christ, as founded upon Peter, the first apostle, the first pope. And being apostolic means that from Peter, every single solitary pope, even the ones who committed in some instances scandals, all the way to Francis, have received indeed the keys of heaven. That being said, um, we are about to begin to discuss these matters more in detail. When we, if we are called to remain loyal, loyal to the doctrine of the faith, loyal to the magisterium of the Catholic Church in Rome, loyal to the institution of the pontificate, it doesn't mean that we have to collaborate with errors, whether they are innocent or not. It means that we must give respect to that which deserves respect, but not rebellion, even if you disagree with what has been stated or done. But to be in opposition is acceptable. It is in some instances even our duty. I unite myself with Monique, with Ron, who is in Australia, watching this show as we speak, with John Henry Weston, with Mrs. Christine Bacon, with uh, uh, Michael Matt, and with so many others that are joining forces in this spiritual mobilization, not against the church on the contrary, but for the church, for our children, for our wives, for all of us, us, who in fact are the Catholic Church. Now, that being said, uh, we are going to begin to enter into this very sensitive uh, subject of the Roman Catholic Church, of what has been foretold to Marie-Julie Janie, not just to the Catholic Church in France, but 
to the Catholic Church throughout the world. No. That's right. Are we, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. As, um, as we spoke last, uh, last week, the apparitions and the prophecies that were given to Marie-Julie Janine so far have all, without exception, been proven to be um, correct. Uh, from the times of Napoleon, Bonap Napoleon III, nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte, all the way to the war, the French war in Algeria, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Many people will ask, surely enough, why always about France? Always France, France, France. There are many reasons for that. Marie-Julie Janine gave indeed an explanation. Although she brings forth in her uh, particular case, uh, prophecies for countries such as England, uh, countries such as Italy, Spain, yes. Germany, and others, Russia. No. But why France? Why is it always it appears the center of orbit and uh, the, of her messages? According to a message she received from both our Lord and the Blessed Virgin Mary, Marie-Julie Jenny was told that France, being the eldest daughter, will uh, be the first nation in civilized world to collapse and fall on its knees. But soon thereafter, will be followed by all the principal countries of the globe. Mm. France mm. is to be seen as a <clears throat> compass of sorts. In other words, by saying what happens in France, you will know what to expect immediately thereafter in your respective country, whether it's in Canada or in Australia or wherever you listen this show from. I've heard a lot of, or rather I read, a lot of comments from people all across the globe, in every continent, including Africa, South America, uh, Northern America, and so on and so forth. Extraordinary. Yeah. But this message is for all of us. There is no limitation. It's not just for Frenchmen, not just for my countrymen, but for all of us. Mm -hmm. I mentioned at the very, I think one of my very first shows with Ron and with Monique, that yes, I'm a Frenchman and a part one. However, being be before being a Frenchman, I'm Catholic. Then I'm a Frenchman. And that makes us all, in this show, compatriots. So you are my fellow countrymen. And I wish to share this with you in the most serious of ways and in the, more, in the gravest of, of ways as well. Because this, as you are about to find out, is quite um, hair-raising and quite serious, quite grave. Heaven has sent a message to Marie-Julie Jenny explaining that the days will come in a particular time, especially after the uh, coming down of a throne in England of a queen, uh, that uh, a great upheaval will take over the civilized world, you know, beginning with the Catholic Church. The Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Michael the Archangel, particularly in many instances, in many messages, have appeared to Marie-Julie Jenny asking for her prayers, asking for her sacrifice. Remember, Marie-Julie Jani, as we spoke two weeks ago, offered herself as a victim soul. A victim soul. Not just for France, but for the Catholic Church itself. Right. Therefore, the Virgin Mary, St. Michael the Archangel, our Lord, have uh, given prophetic messages involving the Catholic Church, describing the fact that the day will come when indeed there will be more and more of a false faith. They will take over the Catholic Church from within. Mm -hmm. Clearly, if we were told from Marie-Julie Jani that through different lobbies, different interests within the Catholic Church, there will be new concepts, new ways of looking at the Gospels, at the liturgy, which will be in the eyes and in the ears of our Lord Jesus Christ, Nothing short but an abomination. Right. She was told that, in fact, the the words of the Passion or the our Lord's sufferings and His Passion would be changed, interpreted differently. Yes, quite so. And the purpose of this whole thing, of this entire campaign, which has begun a very long time ago, in its mm -hmm. conception, in its planning, is principally to replace this faith, this Catholic Church, this dogma, by a new one, under the auspices of an idea of, of um, uh, Catholicism. Catholic uh, of, uh, means universal. 
<laughs> they will use this particular concept of universality as a pretext to gather under a same roof, under the same symbol, different denominations, different faiths, including pagan one, pagan. No. And this under the idea of uniting under the name of brotherhood, human brotherhood, a whole group of faithful who will gather to pray a same God. Mm -hmm. And to that effect, Mar Marie Julie I'm so sorry, I couldn't hear you. And for the sake of fraternity, yeah. Exactly. That word is very popular today. <laughs> fraternity. That's yeah. very true. Yes. And uh, for that particular idea and that particular auspice, um, Marie Julie Jenny tells us there will be a new liturgy, and it, we're not talking about the novice order, but a new liturgy which will ask, according to Marie Julie Jenny, in very specific terms, the celebrant to wear red robes, to use likewise loaves of bread, and to be able to use either water or eventually even wine. The consecration of this particular ceremony will be, in the eyes of heaven, invalid. This is extremely important. And the new verbiage, the new liturgy that will be used in this particular ceremony will be, quote-unquote, an abomination in the eyes and in the ears of God. Mm -hmm. It was told to Marie Julie Jeanne as well that the Roman Catholic Church in the Vatican will likewise uh, will have no up or down. In other words, the seat of Peter will be empty for a great, great many months, not to say years. But the situation will be dear. And for a while, it appears that the church will be led astray by um, the term anti pope was not used, but it will be led astray. And there will be confusion, there will be division, a great deal more division than there is today. And God knows that today the Catholic Church is succumbing and under a civil war of sorts, as I mentioned earlier. On one hand, there are those who continue to maintain that the dogma of, our, of the faith that was established by the popes under our fathers and under, and under their fathers before them is no longer valid. Mm -hmm. Some dare to say, that it is a sin today to rebel against the new ideas, the reformist ideas, uh, which, according to them, come from Vatican II. Vatican II, and I defy anyone to tell me or anyone else otherwise, has never, ever underlined in writing or verbally the fact of that the Tridentine Mass, to name but one, one example, was indeed to be eliminated. It was from the very first conception of Vatican II to be complemented. Now here, I will immediately attract criticism on both sides of the line, either from the conservatives or from the reformists. Mm -hmm. For the conservatives, I have to say the following. I've been, along with my family, one of the followers of Monseigneur Lefebvre, a follower of the first hour. Hence, I say this to you. I have no lessons to receive from anyone especially of late commerce in this particular movement. Nevertheless, I say, very um, strictly say that it is a contradiction, an utter contradiction, to pretend to follow the dogma of the faith of our fathers by condemning by, and by um, rebelling against the constitution of the pontificate. We can be perfectly in disagreement in a civil manner, like gentlemen, we can be in complete disagreement with the statements of the Holy Father, of Pope Francis, I would rather prefer to say. I do not, under any circumstance, um, pledge allegiance to Amoris Laetitia, which I consider an utter error, not to say another word. No. But it is, I disagree, and I do not rebel, but I am in open opposition to this idea. I mean, mm -hmm. firm opposition with uh, Desiderato, Desideravi, which the Pope wrote as a letter on the day uh, the president of the American Parliament, uh, this lady, I never know how to pronounce her name properly. Um, when this lady came to Rome to receive Holy Communion, when she was de facto excommunicated 
by her archbishop in uh, in California. No? When the Pope wrote this particular letter, it was condemned by a few cardinals, by a handful of bishops and an army of, of priests openly and publicly for the first time under the pontificate of Pope Francis as heresy, period. Notwithstanding, if the Pope commits an error, such as, for example, the scandal of Pachamama, allowing mm -hmm. idolatry on holy grounds, and let's say the truth the way it was, for indeed Christ was crucified for the truth and resurrected for the truth. Idolatry took place in the Vatican under the warm, caring smile of Pope Francis, making himself in a way accomplice. This is not subject of interpretation, it's history. Notwithstanding, one of the principal messages that the Blessed Virgin Mary gives again and again and again is respect for the Pope, prayer for the Pope. The Pope needs our intercession. If you refuse, you fall under the temptation set in front of you by the enemy. For indeed, be aware. God has come, or God has sent his mother to tell us, yes, that her son is, came to preach the truth. But I'd be, be aware, in the same way, in the same instance, that God is a reality, so is his enemy. And his objective is first and foremost to make the Catholic Church implode from within. If you fall under the trap to accuse, point, and condemn the Pope, you collaborate openly with the enemy. Our task, like Monique said, like Ron Ray said, our two hosts from this particular show, John Henry Weston, Michael Matt, and so many others, is to pray for the Pope, for his conversion. We must pray for Pope Francis. According, and I'll come back right away to Marie-Julie Janine, but there are also other prophets or the messengers God has chosen very carefully, who are probably even watching this particular show. This show uh, that Ron and Monique are hosting is becoming every day more and more important, subject of more and more conversation throughout the Catholic circles in the internet. Mm -hmm. But men and priests, messengers, heroes, like Father Michel Rodriguez, who, although has been a great deal condemned, has never been, or rather criticized, has never been condemned, but has been as well supported by many due to the fact that never ever none of his um, messages is brought forth have ever been in contradiction with the dogma of the faith by far. Men like him ask us as well to pray for the Pope, not coming from his own personal heart, but from the revelations he's received along the years by our Lord Jesus Christ. This extraordinary prophet, this extraordinary messenger, emissary as well, has been receiving messages since the age of three and confirms the messages of Marie-Julie Jani. Mm -hmm. Pray for the Pope, pray for the cardinals who have fallen under the temptation of error, pray for the Catholic Church. Our fight is called upon our faith and our sword is called upon the Holy Rosary. But not just most importantly through Mass, the Holy Sacrament of the Altar, confession, baptism, conversion to the Catholic Church. Right. I have to say, Xavier, that has, this has been a big topic of conversation this week on our Signal Group. Uh, so many are seeing what's happening in Rome and they, their heads are exploding. And they want to go and speak on the rooftops and they say, you know, we can't be quiet. And... But at the same time, we have to be careful. And as you say, we, we need to pray. We need to, there is a, a need in the church right now. People are, are wondering what to do. How can they help? What, do we speak? Do we not speak? What do you think? Oh, that's a very good question. I think um, if, we were, if we are to listen and to believe in these particular messages, to be silent uh, before um, an infamy, is making yourself a collaborator, an accomplice of sorts. But there are ways of doing so, always with moderation. 
If you begin to be condemning or using a tone that sounds aggressive, you lose all credibility. Right. You must show the example with mercy. Mercy. And I'm not talking of this false mercy that we hear uh, being preached to us every single day. Mercy is not indeed being quiet whenever um, we are presented in front of a situation where, for example, abortion. No? To be quiet, to say nothing when a situation of crisis is coming forth is to make yourself accomplice. But how do you speak up? You cannot say or point fingers as, by pointing fingers at those who have committed abortion and say, look at them, they are content, they will go to hell. No, that's an utter contradiction and certainly not the will of God. God wants us to show the example with kindness. We must pray, fast, do sacrifices, offer a communion for those who fall under those particular traps, for those sins. We are not assigned the responsibility to judge or condemn our fellow man. Our duty as knights of God, you could say, as sons of God, is to indeed take the sword of the scabbard for the Holy Rosary, mm -hmm. through Mass, through prayer. That's our duty. It is Satan who is the accuser. Satanas means the accuser. No. Ours is to remain strong. Our strength remains in an unshakable faith, unshakable loyalty to God, even when sometimes it is difficult. God knows that whenever you hear uh, a priest tells you, I said Mass, just before beginning Mass. And right now we are in a period of the year where churches are asking or collecting money to help women who are uh, considering abortion or not. No. Priests, bishops, cardinals are trying to remain quiet regarding abortion. And their purpose is, and the, shall we say, the politic, they are borrowing from somewhat above them. Mm -hmm. May the listener understand is that charity involves not making uh, those who do not share our opinion feel bad. That's, begging your pardon, rubbish. Now, true charity from the heart is giving to those who are committing an error all the necessary weapons to fight, to change, to convert, and to lead a life that is straight and correct and in accordance with our faith. That is true charity even if it means correcting them gently, mercifully. That's true mercy. But to be quiet for the sake of being quiet and trying not to harm anybody's feelings or trying to gather as many people under the church, that is false charity. Mm -hmm. Charity doesn't mean to condemn. Uh, certainly. Charity means to simply give, teach, lead the way towards the light. By not telling them it's okay, you've done something wrong, but it's okay. God will forgive you. God will forgive those to those who ask forgiveness. And how do you ask forgiveness? There is a sacrament called confession. And some people immediately, I can almost hear them in my mind telling them, telling me, oh, well, I do not need a, a, a priest to confess. And Marie-Julie Janice, through the revelations she's received, says we do. <laughs> but in these prophecies that Marie-Julie Janice has received, she clearly stated that the day when the secret of confession will be violated. Confession will no longer, like many other sacraments in the Catholic Church, have the same value. A false doctrine will be taught. A false Eucharist will be celebrated in union with other um, faiths, pagans, uh, and denominations, Christian denominations, and other faiths, such as the Muslims and others. In fact, the seal of the, uh, of the confessional will be broken, apparently. Exactly. That's what Marie Jolie was told. The day mm -hmm. will come with the bells, Marie Jolie added, will be taken away from churches, from burials. All these things will cease to exist, at least for a while. When the events that have been foretold will once again uh, will, will be finished, will have run their course, there will be a renaissance, a rebirth of the Christian communities, Christian society, the Catholic, Roman, and Apostolic Church will be reborn, will resurrect, like our Lord did mm -hmm. on the third day. 
we are, I'm afraid, to follow the same example of our Lord. Like Peter, we are supposed to carry, like Christ, our cross. We are supposed to reach Golgotha. And when I say we, I mean the Catholic Church. For indeed, to not be mistaken, Catholic Church is not the Vatican, at least not the Vatican alone. Mm. Catholic Church is those of, of you across the other side of the glass of this TV screen. It's the body your, of Christ. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And it is every person who listens to these shows and all the Catholics who are consumed with love, devotion, and faith to the Catholic Church and to its sacraments. No. Mm -hmm. That's the Catholic Church. But we are called to carry our cross, to be crucified, therefore to let uh, the way to something else for a very brief period of time, only to come back and resurrect on the third day, like our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, um, I always like to echo what the Virgin Mary said to Fatima, in Fatima, to the children of, Meji of um, Lami, of uh, the Lucia dos Santos, to Jacinta and to Francisco. At the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. How true. How true. Well, Xavier, um, in La Salette, Our Lady spoke to Melanie about the gravity of blasphemy. Blasphemy today is a sin that is pretty much disregarded. People speak, you know, we use the name of God in vain so frequently without even in, among the clergy. Um, there's no concern. People don't realize just how grave it is. And in fact, as we saw in our episode about La Salette, mm -hmm. Our Lady said that was one of the biggest things that led people to hell. It was blasphemy. And she spoke about it with Marie-Julie as well, didn't she? Quite so. She said that in, uh, in confirmation to La Salette, that indeed blasphemy was, as you mentioned, one of the principal causes of souls condemning themselves to hell. Yes. There are other things as well that the Virgin Mary mentioned uh, to both La Salette, to uh, Melanie Calva, to Maxima Giraud, and to uh, the visionary of uh, La Frode, Marie-Julie Jani. And that's as well um, the scene of working on Sundays. The sun on Sundays are supposed to be the seventh day, which is meant for people to rest, like our Lord did. You know? It is a question of faith not to work. And yet, Marie Religion is stated, again, in a prophetic fashion, that indeed the day will come when all this will be totally ignored and forgotten, to the point where, in all the principal countries, beginning with France, the church's eldest daughter, um, all the shops, stores, Uh, and so on and so forth, all businesses will remain open on Sundays simply because of the la pas du gain, the will of, um, of making money, the attraction mm -hmm. of uh, wealth. No. But the, the most superficial of all of wealth, money. The greatest wealth of all is that which we gather by our actions. And Marie Jolie was very clear. Some of the messages she received involved exactly that. Um, blaspheming, and of course, working on Sundays, very much like La Salle. Those two are extremely, extremely grave sins. They are. And she gave a solution. She spoke about reparation, and she spoke yeah. about, she said, when you hear a blasphemy, say a glory be okay. to console heaven. Exactly. That was, that was beautiful. That is absolutely... Yeah. Very important. Yes, yeah, true. Whenever you hear somebody, even when God knows we all are drivers, yes, and we all <laughs> experience <laughs> a road rage, I think they say American expression. You have and road rage, Claudia. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine it. it. <laughs> I sometimes I, I do, but I am biting my tongue <laughs> quite often, <laughs> all the time, of course. But nevertheless, whenever you hear, or even when you ever um, messages have been conveyed to you in other ways other than verbal, if you know what I mean, uh, just pray at St. Michael the Archangel. The Virgin Mary told Marie Julie Jeanne, indeed, that's one of the redeeming uh, prayers that would uh, erase or console our Lord whenever those particular obscenities, vulgarities are pronounced for whatever reason they are pronounced. Yes, that's a very good point, Marie. <laughs> She also spoke of innocence lost. Well, actually, the devil said that he wanted to use the period of mercy to focus on corrupting children. 
And yeah. I guess if we, we just have to look around today and it's obvious. Right. So, um, I know, Monique, you are uh, the mother, the proud mother of four gorgeous children. <laughs> I'm the proud father of two uh, children as well, whom I am absolutely consumed with affection for. As a father, uh, when I read this particular message that Marie Jeanne received, uh, immediately it rose in me uh, all the shields of protection towards uh, my children. Um, heaven has sent a message that indeed our two priests, uh, the innocent one, the most innocent human beings of all, children, are mm -hmm. the devil's primary target. No. And how so? Uh, on one instance, um, I do not remember, I think it was the Blessed Virgin Mary, I believe, who on in a particular apparition to Marie Julie Janine, she stated that uh, sometimes parents uh, start um, laughing, listening at their children trying to mimic them, by being by using words of uh, vulgarity, obscenities of sorts, words or terms that are mm -hmm. sexually um, indicative, you know? and those instead of uh, inspiring in parents a spirit of correction, inspires mm -hmm. in some of them a spirit of laughter. And yet, uh, the Virgin Mary said, "Those parents do not know what kind of accounts they will have to render before God." at the moment of their death. For they will be responsible not only for their own sins, but those of their children. There was a movie a, a couple of uh, years ago that came out, um, I think it was called The Boys. I, I believe it, it did not go very far, fortunately. But when I saw the first uh, excerpts on uh, YouTube or on television, uh, it was absolutely appalling. It was exactly that young men, uh, young boys, probably were not older than 11 on some instance, 12 maximum. We're looking at, uh, at girls uh, their, of, their, of their age and making references and playing and uh, having their parents with some very famous actors. I, I will not go into it. I don't want to make any publicity to this mediocrity. Mm -hmm. But uh, obviously, it was a movie that was supposed to be a comedy. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, for this kind of comedy, uh, I gladly would pass. But... Um, I am shocked to see that indeed, as Marie-Julie Genis prophesied, prophesied uh, what, is, uh, what is an idea of decency as to indecency, the line is become practically invisible. It's very hard to, deter to, to de determine what is indeed something that is um, correct to something that is profoundly incorrect or simply uh, shocking or scandalous. No. Today, the society in which we are living allows everything, including, uh, again, since we're talking about parents and children and, uh, their, and their, um, <laughs> their innocence, we could go very clearly, uh, not very far, just a couple of steps to see into your children's schools. Right. Now, more and more countries, no, cities, allow to send uh, supposed uh, alleged teachers to teach them about um, intersexual uh, activities and uh, relationship, how we are to accept um, third gender, no? Mm -hmm. How can boys be allowed at such an age, if so, they so wish, to change sex or to change their names? In my country, I regret to say, with profound shame, the government of Emmanuel Macron is permitting just that. They're sending where women or men disguised as women no, uh, transgenders come and read stories, princess stories, where the heroes are boys transforming themselves into girls and girls into boys. It's absolutely a scandal. And all those who permit this and speak quiet, you mentioned earlier, how should we talk? To remain quiet before this obscenity, before this atrocity, abomination, words used by Marie-Julie Jani, are simply accomplices. This is a war, do not be mistaken. There is no neutral ground. You must be, and our Lord was very clear, you are either for me or against me. The lukewarm, the, those who are not hot, but just lukewarm or cold, our Lord will spit them out of his mouth. That's right. I know it is very difficult to hear. No, it's very difficult to hear all this. But the fact of the matter is, 
it is a fact. Unfortunately, you are to use a binary example, you are either one or you are zero. Is there anything in between? <clears throat> right. No. There's a the message that Our Lady gave about this. I'd like to read it if our audience will permit. It's particularly sad and, and distressing and beautiful at the same time. She said, my beloved children, all is engaged in an irreparable loss. I mean the salvation of souls of children. The nourishment of these poor little souls should, for, should be for them the bread of love of their immaculate queen, the queen of heaven. I suffer to see these souls as pastures delivered to the enemy of the salvation of souls. It is the goodness of my divine son that Satan takes to himself. To appropriate it, he has his supporters in every corner on the, on the earth. I despair, yes, I despair of saving those souls who are in an immense danger. Most of these children have entered the path of corruption, and these souls have not received a drop of my perfume of virtues and, pur and purity. It is with an immeasurable pain that I reveal this to you, because if you saw the number of young victims, you would, you would be frightened and even struck as if by a mortal blow. My dear children, those carefree mothers who no longer have the faith, those guilty fathers thrown into circles of bad company where they do nothing but offend my divine son. In heaven, what a responsibility they will have and how many counts will they have to render. They do not think about that. What terrible misfortune. And then our Lord spoke um, about it as well. And he said, I see a multitude of souls that are lost, especially children, even those who do not have the age of reason. And I mean, we can see that on, Dis on the Disney Channel. There are, there are television shows, animated shows, that actually indoctrinate children into Satanism. It is in the open. It is... They don't even hide it anymore. Those who are responsible for the loss of children's souls if they knew what awaits them at the dreaded trial. Children are educated now as adults. This is the education system today with the sex education. Mm -hmm. What shameful words ringing in their ears and echo in their mouths. It is awful and terrible. It makes one tremble to see the youth turn to this point. And they, the children's parents, are not watchful. They do not care. They do, sorry, they do not take care. They do not occupy themselves with what they do. Parents laugh hearing what their children say, and they leave them entirely at liberty to their actions. So sure. she bemoans the parents' irresponsibility, lack of responsibility in all this, obviously. Exactly. And the church, in all this, remains quiet. And that is also a form of complicity, of collaboration. Um, there is a particular medal that um, Our Lady has asked uh, Marie Julie Jani to uh, have reproduced, to produce, and to have propagated. It's called uh, the Medal of Good Guard. Uh, the picture of such a medal is in the book. And there is a particular prayer that uh, calls um, heaven to protect the innocence of the children and also the bearer of those particular medals. There is likewise, and I know, again, I can all, almost imagine uh, all the auditors wonder where could you get such a medal. You can get those medals uh, on the internet. Uh, there is a lady, an American lady in Ohio, and I put actually her email address with her permission. She uh, gets those particular medals and sells them at cost. Mm. She makes zero profit. This lady, her name is Mrs. Kathleen Loney in Ohio, and she's just brilliant. She is totally consummated and consumed rather with the notion of helping as many of as many as fellow Christians as possible to get those particular instruments that Marie-Julie Jani has received from heaven. Yes, she makes uh -huh. amazing kits. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> Xavier sent me one. It was awesome. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Mm. But um, I have my children uh, wear these particular medals, each one of them. No? I wear it myself. And, uh, so do I. <laughs> uh, yes, and uh, we all wear it. 
uh, along with all the, everything else that is requested by Marie Julie Jenny. Marie Julie Jenny. Uh, but uh, again, I do call uh, all those auditors of yours, and I hope as many people as possible through your auditors by them telling them what they've heard. To be aware of these particular messages, these messages uh, have been informally approved by the local bishop, Monseigneur Fournier, in 1876, in June to be precise, of 1876. All this has been studied extraordinarily carefully by the local we're talking um, about sorry we're talking about we're talking about 122,000 pages of transcripts it's not quite a small so. feat yeah <laughs> quite so yeah. but um it's been approved by the local bishop it's been also supported um, by uh, his holiness pope leo the 13th who indeed uh, was supporting openly marie julie Jenny. And finally, by His Holiness Pope Pius XII, who knew Marie Virginie came to visit her before, when he still was a cardinal, before he was elected Pope. When he became Pope, he gave his blessing. I mean, he totally supported the propagation of those particular messages, although it's not been yet formally approved by Rome, but informally through a written letter by her local bishop, uh, Monsignor mm -hmm. Fournier, in June of 1876. So all this particular information you have given, give, give this particular case, this dossier, a certain credibility. It's not uh, something to be dismissed or subject of living room conversation. It is a sincere call. No. Well, we only have we to look at how many of her prophecies have been, uh, have been fulfilled already. It's incredible. Remarkable, isn't it? Yeah. We covered them, I think, last week. Or did we, did we cover them all? Did we cover them all? We, we covered we many. We have many more to cover. <laughs> and that will be next week, I suppose. Yes. <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. tonight is the Catholic Church. So what did marie julie Jenny say precisely about the Roman Catholic Church? She said, indeed, it all would become, begin to fall in Europe. Uh, she mentioned in particular archdiocese, not France, but where she left a blank space in purpose. It was said that marie julie pronounced it, but it appears that as per instructions of a prelate of the time there, that particular archdiocese was not mentioned for some reason. In the documents I read, I haven't found that particular archdiocese, but it was said it would begin from there and it would spread to into neighboring countries. Now it said, and then we will go into um, current events, no, which will indeed confirm that this is already happening. But marie Julie clearly stated that the day will come when bishops and Episcopal colleges will openly rebel against the magisterium of Rome, against the Pope, by writing a written statement clearly stating that those particular bishops reserve themselves the right to save their lives uh, against any persecution in defense of their own faith. This is very serious because it means open disobedience to the dicasterium, or rather to the um, institution of the pontificate uh, in Rome. This means could, a schism, a parallel this, magisterium. Could this be what is happening in Germany? Would that could that archdiocese be the one in could be in Germany? Exactly, you hit the nail on the head. I think that's the American expression. That's exactly what's happening, uh, Nicole, and. What's happening in Germany has no name. Uh, remarkably enough, um, Monique, I mean, I don't know what happening. What happened? I beg your pardon. But um, today, the principal uh, cardinal in the German Episcopal College uh, is Cardinal Max, who is also the Archbishop of the city of Munich. Now, this particular man is the one who started it all, the schism in Germany, that is. And as for those of you who might not be aware, the schism that started in Germany is to form a parallel um, magisterium um, in Germany that would be still called, would call themselves Catholic. But in a way, they would become totally independent from the diktat of the um, Holy, Holy Father. No. To that effect, they want to, uh, to give you but a couple of examples to permit giving communion to um, openly uh, declared uh, homosexual couples or um, 
divorced couples, or for instance, to give communion to a um, married person who is married to a Catholic, but that person being Protestant or atheist. If she wants, if she requires to receive communion, the Catholic bishops of Germany want to grant that particular grace. This is in contradiction with all uh, with um, with all the dogma of the faith and with the uh, canonic law. The Pope, uh, Pope Francis, has uh, initially, when presented with this particular petition, uh, said categorically, no, this is not acceptable. And uh, his aides, of course, confirmed this particular instance. However, uh, what is an inex inexplicable to me is that the Germans started a synod in uh, the year 2020. Uh, with the purpose of finishing by the end of this year, 2022. The president of this particular uh, Episcopal Conference, uh, Cardinal Marx, Archbishop of Munich, uh, reached the age of 75, which requests him to present himself before the Pope and ask him permission to retire. No, he did. Pope Francis refused and asked him to continue at his present post as president of the Episcopal College of Germany and as Archbishop of Munich. This is one instance, once again, when the attitude of the Pope to this Catholic who speaks to you tonight is completely un incomprehensible. In France, we have an expression that says le, pyromania le, pyromaniac, uh, le pompier pyromaniac, uh, which means translates literally into the firefighter who starts the fire. It makes you wonder, makes you wonder. Um, Marie Julie continued by revealing that many churches, and remember, whatever is pronounced or announced for France, will likewise sometimes thereafter happen to the Catholic Church in every other country around the world, but it will begin in France. Hence, it appears that the day will come when statues of uh, the, the saints of the Blessed Virgin Mary will be literally dragged out of churches and new symbols will be put in, in their place to welcome in the name of fraternity all those who aspire to pray to one God, to the same God, no, the Abrahamic uh, God, I assume. No. Notwithstanding, uh, it makes you wonder whether these will likewise include other pagans, like, for example, the Amazonian Indians or the Indians from Canada, like we saw uh, the Pope visit a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. This does not mean that we are to condemn those people. In, probably they are of good faith and they believe in what they do in a cultural way which has been transmitted to them by their fathers and their fathers before them. Nevertheless, true charity lies not just in tolerance. You have to be tolerant, naturally. But true charity lies, as we were told by through Marie-Julie Jani, in giving, in giving to those who do not know, to those who are destitute of the instruments of salvation, to give them those particular instruments. For the truth is only but one, not two. There is no such thing as your truth or my truth. There is only the truth that was brought forth by Jesus Christ, period. With all the goodwill in the world, you cannot convince yourself, or however, however many times you repeat it to yourself, then two and two are five. That is a lie. Two and two are four, and that truth is an absolute value. The same goes for the truth that we were taught by Jesus Christ. By Jesus Christ, salvation can only come through the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. Period. Before Pope Francis, many, many, many centuries before he was even conceived or thought of, the Catholic Church stated that there is no salvation outside the Roman Catholic Church. By that statement, it meant merely that those who wish to be saved and to be with God at the end of one's lives have to follow the teachings of Christ. You cannot win salvation if you do not convert. However, God in his infinite mercy and in his infinite love for mankind will give a chance to every soul to convert. And we are told about this also via Marie-Julie Jani, the great illumination of conscience. But Let's go back further back in the history of our faith. Let's go back to the moment of crucifixion. The fair, mm -hmm. and we mentioned this before, 
the very first human being to have ever entered or to have been promised paradise, the very first human being to have entered, entered paradise before the Blessed Virgin Mary, before St. Joseph, was the worst of men, not even a Christian, not even a follower of Christ. That is to say, until the very last moment of his life, just before death, the man crucified on Christ's left, at the end told Christ, Jesus, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And we all know our Lord's answer. In truth, in truth, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Mm -hmm. That is mercy. Because that man converted. The same cannot be said, I regret to say, to the man who was condemned on our Lord's stride. Again, we must not, and I should not, uh, judge. It is, does not income me that responsibility, nor you, nor any of us. Mm -hmm. Our responsibility is to stand, to respond present to the call that the Virgin Mary, or through her, our Lord, heaven, is asking us to respond to, to, to say present to this call of mobilization, spiritual mobilization we find ourselves to, into. And Marie Julie predicted it. The times of confusion will be greater and greater and greater until finally the great precise takes place. But before the great chastisement, Marie Julie Jani, and this I think we'll talk about it next week, but a brief aperçu, a brief review, shall we say. Marie Julie Jani did mention ever so briefly about the uh, warning to come, or the El Aviso, as I say in Garavandal, or the great illumination of conscience, as the mm -hmm. Anglo Saxons call it. A uh, last Pentecost that will give us a chance to convert yet again. Mm -hmm. Um, Xavier, we, we're having in our in our chat here, um, a lot of people are mentioning the, the the extension of the synod. Pope Pope Francis just announced on Sunday the extent that, that it would be extended another year. What do you make of that? I believe that uh, in all his goodwill, Pope Francis tends to mistake to mistakes the kingdom of God as a democracy of sorts. Mm -hmm. Some, I believe that it must be put very clearly into the mind of the faithful that the kingdom of God is no democracy. The kingdom of God is a monarchy where yes. Christ is our Lord, our King, and the Blessed Virgin Mary, our Queen. The church is not to be dictated by the faithful how to lead. It is the church to lead the faithful. And the faith, the teachings of Christ, the truth does not change with fashions of the time. That would be my the best answer I'm able to, to form. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, there was a question about Pope Leo XIII. He made a prediction um, and he said, the church will be deprived of its leader who governs now, meaning himself, the remains of this present holy pontiff have to disappear. The imprint of his feet at the holy altar will be reduced to ashes by the flames of hell. The head of the church will be despicably outraged. And you mentioned in your book, you were questioning whether that could be the Leonine prayers. The Leonine prayer. mm -hmm. Exactly. Remember that uh, Leo XIII was indeed... Uh, Actually, you were the one who brought that to my attention the other day, uh, Monique. Uh, Leo XIII was the Pope uh, who witnessed a conversation between Satan and our Lord, very much mm -hmm. like Marie Julie as we covered that last, last week. And because of this particular incident, uh, Pope Leo XIII decided immediately when he got back his senses to run to his office and write the Leonites' prayers, which include at the end, the St. Michael the Archangel prayer, which, by the way, is an exorcist prayer. Yes. Now, in this particular prophecy that His uh, Holiness Leo XIII stated, he very rightfully foresaw that uh, during a future time, uh, those particular Leonides prayers that always take place after the, the priest gives the final blessing and everyone says, Deo gracias, thanks mm -hmm. be to God, no? at the end of Mass. Well, it was 
common as per request of Leo XIII to do the Leonine prayers, which finished always with the Saint Michael the Archangel prayer to defend the church from evil attacks. Well, because of, I believe, uh, Vatican II, since Vatican II, someone had the brilliant idea to think that this was too much and to eliminate it, therefore opening the door wide open to any potential evil uh, influence that would come in a way that perhaps we're not even aware of. Well, in, this fact, one, yes. in fact, they were meant specifically for the protection of the church and for the conversion of sinners. Two things exactly. we desperately need now. So, yeah. Exactly. And you only have to see the state of the Catholic Church today in comparison to, the, to that of the time of Leo XIII. The churches were full. The, all the seminarians were full. Today, what is the state of our church led by those particular men who thought to be wiser than God? Why is it, I ask, that all those conservative um, seminarians, uh, all those places where the uh, seminarists mm -hmm. follow the Tridentine um, liturgy, uh, all those uh, seminarians of Monseigneur Lefebvre, how come in France, Switzerland, in the United States, all those are full to the brink? But those of Novus Ordo, I am so empty. Why? I think that those who are defending uh, the uh, reformist movement uh, should wonder as well. The answer is, I'm afraid, uh, as big as uh, the nose on your face, as we say in French. <laughs> I have another question for you. Um, she said that she... She said... Oh, it was our Lord who said... I see the bishops, many, so many of them, and in their following all their flock, and without hesitation, they are rushing into damnation and going to become an object of horror for the most part of my people. And this is the, what I'm struggling to understand. All youth will be spoiled and soon will fall in putrefaction, the smell of which will be unbearable. What is he referring to, disease or corruption of the soul? Corruption of the soul. Putrefaction in French, putrefaction is mm -hmm. when something becomes rotten. No? Right. And what the message here meant is very clearly in this new uh, faith, this new church that will embrace every denomination, every other faith, everything that adores the anti Catholic, anti -Catholic spirit. Uh, there will be many bishops who will fall um, seduced by this new ideology of embracing everyone, every single idea, mm -hmm. under the auspices of fraternity, brotherhood, all together united to press in God. That's the great lie. That's a liturgy that will not be recognized as valid by our Lord, by heaven, and whose words will be considered an abomination. Those messages that Marie-Julie Janie were ex extremely clear and were not subject to interpretation. If they were subject to any interpretation, it would be in matters of the intensity thereof. But the fact of the matter is, it was very clear. A new faith will immerse from the ones, from the leadership within the Catholic Church, and to be able to grow and to unite under the idea of brotherhood, they will make concessions which will be totally and completely unacceptable to God. Mm -hmm. Often I wonder, uh, Monique, and I would be very interested to know what you think, but often I wonder, uh, my goodness, why is it such an important factor to have so many people inside a church? Is it better to have a church with possibly half full, with people that are consumed with love and fervor and faith, than have an entire church filled with people who are Pharisians? I mean, it seems to me that the value is in quality, not in quantity. And I would be really interested to know what, what you think, Monique. What I think. I agree with Pope Benedict, who said that there would be a small remnant left, that the church of the future would be much smaller, but it will be strong, it'll be vibrant. And I think, well, just by reading the comments in our signal group, I have to say, we can see it happening. The people are waking up and finally starting to take their faith, you know, appreciate their faith. We've taken our faith for granted for too long. And throughout history, we've seen that 
you know, whenever we take our faith for granted, a great persecution happens, people come back to the faith, and there's a, you know, it settles down, there's, there's again, a lull, and people don't, you know, the, a drop in the faith, there's a great persecution, and they come back to the faith. And now we're seeing it again, we're, we, we're in a lull where, you know, people are turning from the faith, but I think there's a, there's a renewal happening as well. So there's a positive side to all this. Um, yeah. And um, she mentioned also, um, she said she saw real pastors being replaced by others formed from hell, initiated in all vices, in all iniquities, perfidious men who will cover souls with filth. New preachers, new sacraments, new baptisms, new confraternities. And yes. I wonder, you know, when we hear about what's happening in China with the Pope having to choose his bishops from a list submitted by the government, um, these are not, they're not chosen by the church truly. Is this possibly part of that? Exactly. That's a brilliant example. I would say for, it would be in Europe, for example, or in the States, wherever. The Catholic Church is in completely infiltrated with Freemasons. But regarding China, that's a brilliant um, example you, you took. Indeed, there was a secret uh, agreement that was signed between the government of China, communist continental China, and the Vatican. No one, not even Cardinal Zen, who was the Archbishop Emeritus of Hong Kong, one of the principal defenders of the Catholic faith in China, not even he, and was made aware of the terms of those contracts, of this agreement that took place between China and the Vatican. And indeed, you are extremely, you're absolutely right. Uh, the agreement was made, whereas for bishops to be tolerated in the country, in the Chinese Republic, they would have first to be chosen to be later confirmed by the Pope. But the choices that were to be submitted were to be chosen by the communist yes. government of China. Yes. And all of them, I say all of them have all been excommunicated prior to this decision, prior to this agreement. They have all been excommunicated by Rome and defrocked. All of a sudden, because of this secret agreement, signed, approved, and um, sealed by Pope Francis, those particular bishops have come back to the surface as legal tender, as legal bishops in those particular cities and communities in China. Some of them are married. Some of them have even uh, illegitimate children. Mm. <laughs> it's extraordinary. And those who are faithful to the faith, who have maintained and defended themselves, have been martyrized. Some of them arrested, thrown into the, uh, into the cities, uh, into the streets. They had nowhere to go. And all those who would defend them or host, host them would be threatened with the threat of prison, jail. So is the world in reverse? In I can only talk more of my own country, but I have known a multitude of bishops who openly declare themselves members of a Masonic Lodge. Be aware that the Masonic Lodge has been condemned in the whole history of the Catholic Church since the early 18th century, 25 times. And the Catholic Church, Church to this day condemns any Freemasons to excommunication de facto. In other words, if you call yourself a Catholic, and this is very important for those of you who are listening to this particular show, all of those who call themselves Catholic and are a member of a free Masonic lodge or society do not have the right to receive Holy Communion. Period. What do you do? If indeed you are of good faith and you didn't know, you must abjure. You must go in as soon as you can to see a priest. Abjure your um, relations with this Freemasonic Lodge or society. Abjure, confess, and then you will be back uh, into the arms of mm -hmm. the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. This is not coming from me. This is no. canonic law. In fact, and uh, Pope John Paul II, who um, spoke about himself being surrounded within the Vatican walls by Freemasonic cardinals and bishops. 
he, he spoke to his good friend, Joseph Torellia, who was a visionary himself, who was tortured in, is it Hungary, I believe? or um, And he told him, you know, he was surrounded, he was in, in a nest of vipers. So really, it's the, the Freemasonic influence within the Vatican, the destruction of the church from within, or the attempt to destroy the church from within that we see now. Yes, quite so. Um, in the book, I r write about um, one of the principal objectives of uh, the Freemasonics, of Freemasonic lodges that started uh, regarding the church, regarding the world, including the world wars, three world wars that they were planning. It's mm -hmm. quite a, it was a, with a, one of the principal leaders, uh, Pike, an ex American general during the Civil War, Albert Pike, I believe. He, is, uh, he, he made a statement of his objectives. Were even put in a British museum in London, but um, it was taken by a, a, a study a scholar who discovered it and had it exposed. The document mysteriously disappeared, but the text still exists, and I reproduce it here. It's quite astonishing. But uh, to Marie Julie Jenny, uh, in this particular chapter, Saint Michael the Archangel, particularly more so, I would say than the Virgin Mary, appeared to her to discuss, condemn, and promise the defeat and destruction at the end of every single Freemasonic lodge. So their time is counted. Right now, they're in a position of utmost power. They control every domain of world economy, of all the particular circles of politics, whether uh, on the right or on the left, whether Democrat or Republican, uh, Republican, Socialist, or uh, Nupes in France, and so on and so forth. When I met Father Laurentin, we did discuss the Freemasonic lodges, you know? and he told me one thing, you know, Xavier, he used to say in his uh, very soft, well-spoken manner, uh, in France, it's very easy to enter into Masonic lodges because they will offer you all sorts of mirage and success if you enter and uh, apply to their uh, ideology. But to leave is considerably harder. There is a way to leave, and the greatest part Leave feet first. So it is indeed a very dangerous organization, world organization. So uh, the, nevertheless, all those who place themselves at the feet of the cross who respond present to this message of the Blessed Virgin Mary are protected. And that's another promise that our Lord made to Marie-Julie Jenny. She very, he very clearly stated to her, I will protect my own and those who will help me propagate this message. So myself, like many others who are doing this particular work, um, place ourselves at the feet of the cross. And uh, we believe and entrust ourselves to divine providence. Yes, we do. <laughs> um, our Lord mentioned, he bemoaned the the betrayal of the priests, especially well, starting then, but also now, especially in the end times, he said that there would be so few of them that would be true priests. And he mentioned that they would be extremely punished, that their punished would be unequal, that punishment would be unequaled. Um, yeah. And he said, woe to the priest who does not reflect on the enormous responsibility which he will have to give account back to me. And the pastors of the church, the bishops, what will they do for the faith? The great number is ready to give up their faith to save their bodies, the suffering they cause will never be repaired. Mm -hmm. You have to feel pity for those uh, souls uh, who have taken upon themselves the immense responsibility to be a priest, to convey at, be at the beginning, to echo the words of Christ, to give his person through the holy sacrament of the Eucharist, which is not a symbol, as we know. It is truly the body and blood the soul and the divinity of Jesus Christ, the same one who raised the dead, who made the blind see, the same one who walked on waters, the same one who raised Lazarus from the tomb. That's, mm -hmm. He is there in the Eucharist, physically present. So those souls, those priests who will betray Christ, who in his own terms will continue or crucify him again, are to be pitied. But what awaits them is unmentionable. However, Again, the Virgin Mary has asked Marie-Julie Janie 
to convey a message of mercy in the sense that we are not to criticize uh, a priest, even however bad he might be or not, because as long as he's alive, he still has a chance to convert. And instead of condemning, instead of pointing fingers, we as human beings here on earth, as faithful, we must help them to get them out of the trap under which they fell victim of by praying for them, by interceding for them, by offering our communions for them, by offering our fasting and sacrifice. But you're quite right. Their case is extremely serious. Excuse but they are also the first target of, of the enemy, primary target. And um, we have an account of St. Joseph speaking with our Lord, um, his foster son, and interceding for the priesthood and asking him for a restoration of the church without bloodshed. And our Lord said, no, it's not possible. We remember that according to Father Michel, St. Joseph is the catechon of the church spoken of. And so here he is fulfilling his role, speaking out for, you know, interceding for priests. But our Lord said, no, too much has been done. And now they will incur the punishment that it requires. Yes, yeah. it's, uh, it's extremely serious. It's extremely grave. But their responsibility is so huge. Uh, these men, when they started, when they went to seminary, they gave up everything. The possibility to have a normal life, a wife, children. They made a lot of sacrifices and maybe, perhaps, they all started with a good spirit. But remember, again, Marie Jolie uh, repeats again and again that the very first targets of the devil are indeed all those souls that have consecrated themselves to God, mm -hmm. priest. Yeah. No? And to that effect, uh, many of them, many of them will succumb. Many of them will collapse and fall victim to the temptations of the enemy. We have to feel pity, for that's all they deserve. But with pity comes intercession. We are called to help these souls. In one instance, mm -hmm. I remember one of the messages that Marie-Julie Jani received. Uh, she saw a lot of priests, I believe, in purgatory. And all the souls that are in purgatory, keep in mind, are holy souls for the one day or the other, they will leave purgatory to go to heaven. No one stays in purgatory forever. Mm -hmm. No one. No. Eternity is only for hell and for heaven. But purgatory is a um, presence, uh, or rather a state of reality, of existence, after death, where souls go to, to wash their, their souls, to cleanse themselves, to purify them themselves in order to be worthy to go to heaven. But Marie Lijonie, I believe it was her, stated that many priests were found there reading books, the Bible, and they were there for a very long time. Simply the reason or the explanation she was given was because they have no one who pray for their liberation or who pray for their inter in intercession of them. So once again, I invite all the auditors, uh, whenever they have the time or whenever they pray for their loved ones, perhaps to put a brief parenthesis in the prayers and say, and we offer this prayer for all the souls in purgatory, particularly those who have no one to pray for them. I think there, there is a prayer of St. Bridget that whenever you pray it, you liberate a thousand souls into heaven. Or so oh, that St. Is Gertrude. St. Gertrude. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So I invite uh, everyone again to uh, review uh, this particular prayer and to pray it. It's very helpful. Yes, indeed. Um, our Lord spoke. Um, no, it was the Blessed Virgin Mary who said in 1880, she said, for a period of time, all the works approved by the infallible church will cease to exist as they are today. In this sorrowful annihilation, brilliant signs will be manifested on earth. If because of the wickedness of men, holy church will be in darkness, the Lord will also send darkness that will stop the wicked in their search of wickedness. Mm -hmm. The message is clear. Again, it appears very clearly in this message that indeed a false doctrine will come to surface. But at the end, God will send a, a greater darkness upon the enemies of the church. And that is what I believe, among other things, will be part of the chastisement. The chastisement will, be, um, will have different um, folds. 
One of them, of course, will be uh, the chastisements of uh, disease and plague throughout the world. But one of them will be as well, which will be, the, I believe, the last one, the three days of darkness, a subject which I know we will talk about in a later episode. No? But yes, there will be a false doctrine that will come forth from the church and where, which will not be accepted by all the priests, by all the bishops and by all the cardinals. But I believe that based on those messages, the Catholic Church, the real Catholic Church, will be forced to celebrate, to adore, like in the times of the catacombs, in secret. Yes. That is why it is important, it is imperative, that we prepare now. I don't believe that it is a coincidence uh, that your Catholic channel, you know, um, Mother and Refuge of the End of Times, is uh, growing so exponentially in popularity. And that is not, to, for matters of pride, I say this, there is a reason for this. There is a reason for these messages all of a sudden to take and grab so much attention. The time has come for people to be aware of these messages which have been trying to be dusted under the convenient carpet of forgetfulness, particularly in Rome. It is time for those of you and for the others that possibly you will be called to talk about these things, to be aware of this particular call from heaven for your urgent conversion. Particularly for those who are who have children, who are married, who have families, and you want but the best and the well-being of your own. And I'm not just talking about this, the well-being of your skin. I'm talking of the well-being of your soul, of your heart. Because eternity is what awaits us afterwards. It is really up to all of us to decide which side we want to join. Yes. And God in his infinite mercy and love through such a loving and imploring mother. He's asking us to choose his side. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. You mentioned in your book how Our Lady emphasized the high dignity of the priesthood and how people will no longer respect this dignity because the priests themselves will forget the greatness of their office and their exalted mission to serve God and save souls. And all this under the auspices of new ecclesiastical reforms. Yes. I... On a personal note, I have known a countless priest who were good men, who are good men, who to this day are afraid to appear disobedient uh, mm -hmm. of some mm -hmm. um, new reforms that are being established uh, in Rome, particularly by uh, Pope Francis. For example, Amoris Laetitia, to, to name but one amongst a multitude of other things that are ever so contradictory to our faith. It's exhausting. It's simply exhausting because you try to ask an explanation whether, for example, how is it that in those particular statements made by Pope Francis, which were made in no way, shape or form, in ex cathedra format, ex cathedra meaning that he invokes the infallibility of the church. No? So whenever you declare, whenever the Pope declares something ex cathedra, it means that it's infallible. It, mean, it must be considered dogma. Right, but nevertheless, Amoris Laetitia was never stated or issued as ex cathedra. It's not considered or declared even by Pope Francis himself as infallible. And though, and yet, you find priests that are of good faith, that are good men, who are trying to justify those particular statements, or even the situation of Pachamama. I had a priest who told me, "Well, no, you don't understand the matter with Pachamama. The message of the Pope was that of an ecologist, ecological." message to save the planet so my answer to him is well father in that case what are you waiting to put a pachamama on your altar he immediately looked at me like this laughing and he didn't answer obviously what on earth could a good man answer mm -hmm. sometimes by trying to justify the injustifiable you make yourself an accomplice yes i mentioned this as, as well and i think in your show i will be very brave on this but being a frenchman i grew up with the stories of the war no my parents lived under the occupation and the German occupation. Tremendous humiliation that every Frenchman uh, has uh, heard stories of and grown up with. And unfortunately, like the rest of Europe, it was not just a French thing, all of Europe found enormous amounts of uh, French population collaborating with the enemy, with the Nazis. The same thing here is happening. Today, we don't hear from the BBC, pom, 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 which is in Morse code V. It's the letter V for victory, no? 
you don't hear the German uh, noise trying to <laughs> obstemperate the message received that the BBC was sending to the resistance. No? But today, the message that we are receiving might not be coming from the BBC, but comes from these particular messages, from Marie-Julie Jani, that's our BBC, from Fatima, from Akita, from La Salette. The message is there, and our call is a call of resistance as well. And the question is, we cannot collaborate or justify the unjustifiable, because by doing so, for all the best purposes or best reasons you might want to do so, you make yourself an accomplice to evil, to anti-Christianity, to anything but what our Lord has come on earth to teach us, the Gospels, the dogma of the faith. That must be our life, the catechism. And I recommend particularly the catechism of Pope uh, John Paul II. But most of all, our son, around which we must orbit, are the holy sacraments. Particularly, and I cannot say it enough, I know I sound like an old scratch record, but the holy Eucharist and confession. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, Our Lady has mentioned to Marie-Julie Jaini that uh, of the great need to pray for priests and for sinners, that believing in her son is not enough to earn one's salvation. This is a big thing nowadays. We People believe that if you, as long as you believe, you're okay. But it's not enough. And Our Lady went on and said um, that we must live there. We, men must leave their, lead, sorry, live their faith, combat one's evil tendencies, and live the faith with deeds and acts of conversion. She recommends, she asks for confession, for frequent communions, for many prayer, for praying the rosary, and for the way of the cross, which hasn't been mentioned much by other visionaries. That's very true. The way of the cross for Marie Virginie was ever so important. She used to, to leave the passion of the Christ leave the Passion of the Christ with the stigmata every single Friday. She was going through what our Lord went through every Friday. And that was one of the things that led the Bishop of Nantes to give his approval and support. Uh, regarding, yes, there are matters of believing and not being enough. You're quite right. Uh, this letter, Polosi, that's the woman I, I had in mind. When Polosi went to Rome and received communion, no? The Pope wrote this letter called Desiderio Desideravia, no? which stated and which was condemned by cardinals, bishops, and priests as being heretical. Not my words, theirs. No? Mm -hmm. This particular letter stated that it should be enough for anyone to approach the Holy Altar and ask Holy Communion based simply on the faith they have in the Holy Gospels and in the teachings of Christ. That should be enough. Yeah. No. That's a violation of canon law, and that's a violation of the dogma of the faith. Again, an absolute truth. No. There was somebody that I spoke with recently who told me, well, Xavier, if I believe in Christ, I'm saved. You do not need anything else but believing in Christ. Really? What about Satan? Satan believes that Christ is really the Son of God. Is he saved? He didn't know how to answer. That's right. It is not enough, like you said, uh, Monique, that you said it beautifully. It is not enough to believe. It is important to live your faith, to demonstrate with actions, with facts, that you live by the word, by nourishing ourselves through the Eucharist. That's one thing. We have also to nourish ourselves with his word. It's not enough to believe. And as Our Lady says, to combat one's evil tendencies, not defend them, not justify them as we do, which is so popular today. Right. So now if we move on in your book, in your chapter, you mention that in Rome, the storm will be the blackest. The storm of Rome will be even worse than the storm in France. All the wrath of the ungodly is in Rome. All the anger of the wicked is focused on the Holy See. However, the chastisements will begin with Paris. And you mention um, in another, well, in another message, um, there will be signs in the sky before the storm breaks over Paris and France, 24 hours before the burst of this storm, which will be ever so black. Our Lord will give signs in the firmament. Ah, without the sac sacred heart, we would all perish. All priests who are not good will be punished. 
And then you mention, or no, our Lord mentions or, uh, to Marie-Julie that um, church authorities are going to surrender to this new government. There's going to be a new government in Italy. A very uh, a tyrant will take over, followed by an even worse tyrant who will go after Christians. Um, that they will target monasteries and convents and butcher, you know, priests, nuns, religious, especially in Naples. Yes, our Lord, or rather, I think it was actually Saint. It was. I do not remember if it was Saint Michael the Archangel or the Holy Spirit. But indeed, Marie Ligene received a revelation from heaven, stating that there will be a tyrant that will be coming from the father's uh, depths of Pakistan, crossing, or rather, and also from eastern Iran, crossing all of Persia, crossing all of Iraq and Syria. He will be coming from um, a family that will be half German and half uh, Pakistani. They, this family originally would have been Catholics. However, they will have converted into Islam. Now, these two brothers, one of them, the one you mentioned for Italy, his name uh, is Ar Arcael de la Torre. Marie-Julie Jeanne had, the, I think it was the Holy Spirit, had it repeat three times the name, because it was not a French name. It's difficult, as you can tell in the way I pronounce it, it cost, it's a twist, a tongue twister. Is that the correct mm. expression? That's Don't right, twist. yes. Arcael de la Torre. That's now, really cool. Now, it's Italian. Yes. I even wonder if it is not some sort of anagram with the letters. I do not know. But that was the name that she, she mentioned. And these two brothers would be coming from this, the depths of Pakistan slash Iran. And one of them would take, for a very brief period of time, the head and the control of Turkey. But his head, his head will roll shortly thereafter. Arkel de la Torre will arrive to Italy and take control upon the invitations of his friends. There, there will be a persecution against the Christians, very much alike the one that the Germans and the Nazis uh, adopted against the Jews during the Holocaust. And there is indeed a butchery, a massacre, that has been predicted in the city of Naples, of Napoli, in southern Italy, where Arcel de la Torre will massacre countless Christians, including religious, and burn and destroy convents of all uh, different orders in Italy. That man will truly be the Antichrist, a temporary Antichrist, for the time, for a very brief period of time. And then finally, Italy will be liberated by the French monarch, who will come all the way to Rome to restitute from whatever remains of Rome the, the new Pope. And then will come the great chastisement, which will be in the form of the three days of darkness. Yes. And um, is it, it, uh, I think it's our Lord who mentions it will be by force that they will be dragged out of the temple. Then the order will come out to flee quickly. The vengeance of hell will rise to the altars of the most infamous of all men, those possessed. They will be possessed. They will take the place of the true servants of the Lord. Everything will be against the faith and against the, the holy laws in their sacred ceremonies. The law will oblige parents to leave them to pervert their children. These sacrileges will last 44 days. Many Christians will suffer martyrdom. These crimes will be followed closely by the vengeance of the Lord. Yes. Uh, however, as we go along in the chapter, you will see that there will be some instruments given to all the families of the faithful to protect themselves from what is to come, including persecution. So uh, I look forward, very much forward, for the next week's uh, show to discuss those particular instruments. But yes, this persecution will be against Christians who will not accept this common uh, religion, this, you could say, almost world religion. Yes. Which is supposed to gather all these denominations, all these faiths together into a falsehood. So many, there will be many persecutions. The French government in France, being uh, of, at the time, as described here, will be of a left party, will be uh, communist, socio-communists. And uh, they will ally themselves to another party which will be headed and composed principally of foreigners, uh, false uh, Frenchmen 
who will have absolutely nothing but hatred and despise for the French culture and history. This um, political organization will take over and will cause some sort of uh, martyrdom against the Christians and the Christian church. And they will even replace such things as, for example, the Sacré-Cœur in Montmartre. It was predicted by Marie Julie Jani that Montmartre, all the specificities of uh, what made Montmartre a place of uh, Catholic cult, of Catholic uh, adoration, will be replaced by a place of that will be a sort of a political parliament uh, sitting well above the highest place of Paris, overlooking the capital. No, this is an, uh, an outrage, naturally, of course. But this will be an example among many others that will take place in France and after France throughout the entire world before the rebirth of, uh, of society. She mentioned, she also, she was also told that there would be a movement against the Sacred Heart, the devotion of the Sacred Heart. Yes. She said that indeed, every, the Sacred Heart is one of the principal pillars of, uh, of Catholic faith. So naturally, it and the devotion to the Immaculate Heart, both Sacred Heart and Immaculate Heart, will be particularly oppressed and mm -hmm. forbidden to adore in public places. You know? Paris will be completely uh, attacked in the sense that this will no longer be tolerated. This kind of adoration and devotion will still be permitted or will exist, shall we say, in the countryside, particularly uh, in Brittany, in the region of Vendée, which is south of Brittany, and parts of Normandy, although in other parts as well. There is a map in the book of France uh, where Marie-Julie Genie was told what particular areas of France, what cities would be protected, not just from calamities, but also from all those sorts of persecutions, and what regions of France will be considered, quote-unquote, the safest place in the universe, end of course. So all this is in the book. It's extraordinarily interesting. And um, I might have mentioned it here on in another show. I do not remember, but uh, I'm planning, among other things, to possibly go to Brittany next year uh, as a scout journey to look around, although I know quite well Brittany, but to go in the central part. Another prophecy, and we'll discuss this, next week, I suppose, will be the rise of oceans up to 35 meters. Mm -hmm. And uh, there will be places uh, that will be refuges. Now, your homes can be also mentioned as refuges. All this I will discuss more in detail uh, next week with you, mm -hmm. uh, Monique. But, next uh, week, but a little further, yes. <laughs> yes. As you wish. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. We have a lot but, more uh, messages to cover before, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You also mentioned, okay, the church will have its seat vacant for long months, long months. There will be two success antipopes that will reign all this time over the, the Holy See. Yes. How, yes. Can you comment on that? I'm almost afraid to. <laughs> but I have my little idea on the subject. Uh, and it also corroborates with uh, another prophecy that was hidden by the church in La, La Salette which was that, uh, I will say it in French and then translate in English. Um, it, in La Salette, a lady said to the children, il y aura deux papes vermoulus, which means, mm -hmm. I believe, the best translation, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Monique, there will be two earth-ridden uh, popes. Is that the correct translation? I think you, you had said worm-ridden. Worm worm-ridden. That's you were not the proper way. Yes, well, I think that's... Will be they will be rotten, in other words. They will be rotten, yes. Exactly. So, yes, Marie-Julie Zanin mentioned this particular prophecy of two popes, two anti-popes that would follow, that would be consecutives. Well, who could that be? Mm -hmm. I, that's very grave uh, to say. I have my ideas. I know that uh, there are rumors now, and I'm not going to say what I think, mm -hmm. but simply in parallel. I simply would say that there are rumors right now that... Pope Francis might happen to have a cancer of sort, and he has been told for a while. So he has uh, expedited the election of new cardinals for a new pope he has in mind to be elected. That's interesting information. I do not say anything more. I'd rather not. Mm -hmm. Yes. In our signal group, uh, one of our uh, listeners was mentioning that based on that, um, the synod would be concluded by another pope. Right. That's a possibility. Right, so. 
Yes. Right now, there have been so many popes that have been chosen by Pope Francis, uh, which are electable uh, to become the next pontiff, that it is very likely, the chances are, statistically speaking, that indeed the next pope would be uh, one that spouses the ideas of Pope Francis. Yeah. Mm. Who knows? Pardo, you, we mentioned earlier, you and I, uh, Père Michel Rodrigue uh, in Quebec. He mentioned that uh, uh, possibly uh, this Pope Francis would realize uh, of the errors he has committed and he will try to repair them. But according mm. to the revelation he has received, he will try to, um, to change them, but it will be too late. But uh, to further uh, the revelations that Father Rodrigue has received, it appears, according to him, that uh, Pope Francis, having realized his errors and con having changed and realized what was a true path, um, in his attempt to rectify, will die a martyr. Those mm -hmm. are, again, not my words, but Father Rodrigue's. And according to him, sometimes thereafter, shortly thereafter, it will be the turn of uh, Pope Benedict XVI, who likewise is supposed to die a martyr. Father Laurentin, when I used to work with him, for the brief amount of time I did, it was a few years, you know, but it's still brief, or so it seemed, uh, you used to have profound horror to deal with prophecies. For him, this was the most difficult part and the most delicate part of it all, of all the messages that heaven sent for his mess messengers, simply because uh, history is not written on stone. History is subject to the behavior of man and to his potential conversion. So I am more and more I'm involved in, in this particular situation, the more I realize how, how right he was. Yes, indeed. There is a, an intriguing prophecy that we're going to end with tonight about Amiens in France. Um, there was an announcement of an, an upcoming apparition site of the Blessed Virgin Mary in France. Yes. On the 16th of November, 1882. I'm not sure if it's Our Lord or Our Lady who said, oh, it's... Mm, Blessed Virgin Mary. The Blessed Virgin Mary who said, in the land of Amiens, France, the Mother of God is about to set up her visit with the child Jesus in her maternal arms and warn the people mixed as everywhere else. There will be a sign in the sky. The voice of a little child will announce with divine permission the terrible sorrows that await the country. He will announce them a very short time before these projects occur. This child will speak for about 27 minutes with tears in his voice, which will affect even the leaves of the grass. This announcement, terrible for France, will be universal. Your thoughts? I think that uh, reflects perfectly uh, the overall messages that Marie Julie received. It will affect France, but the effects will be universal. Uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this show, France was uh, announced as the first country to collapse on its knees and to be reduced uh, to humiliation, defeat, destruction. Sh soon after, shortly after, to be followed by the rest of the world. According to prophecy, likewise, France will be the first nation to get back on its feet, soon thereafter to be followed by the rest of the world. In this instance, this child could be a, and I think now in retrospective that your interpretation, Monique, from uh, our conversation before this show is the correct one. Uh, I thought originally that the young child could possibly be the visionary in Amiens, the city of Amiens, where this future apparition is supposed to start. But you mentioned, could it possibly be that of Christ as a child? In retrospective, I'm wondering, and I now I, I'm tending to go your way. I think uh, it takes a woman <laughs> to see with a maternal heart that a message such as uh, deep as this one can only come from the Son of God. So I, I changed my mind. I'll go along with... Uh, with your uh, interpretation. But yes, I think um, this will be also another proof that this particular case is truly a print from heaven. Mm -hmm. There are very many bold predictions in, this, in, in these 
uh, prophecies with actual names, places, timelines. It's going to be a fascinating. Um, it's going to be fascinating to see all these things become fulfilled, um, and and we we are in the midst of it. So it's it's quite an exciting. Well dangerous but exciting time at the same time we see god's will at work and again i guess through all this we have to remain at peace and consider that there is nothing that can happen to us that our lord has not allowed he's in control and he has a plan so we need he needs our fiat and he will be there for us and take us through it so <laughs> yeah beautiful said. quite so um i said they would have us to finish uh, by telling by asking your auditors simply this uh, to maintain uh, your souls in peace to avoid uh, condemning to yes to keep a critical uh, spirit whenever you hear of an apparition or another I know there is so much division even within the traditionalist parties so much division about places such as Mezgorje such as uh, even Reverend Father Michel Rodrigue, avoid lack of charity, avoid condemnation. Ask for the, the inspiration from God to determine, to discern the truth from a lie, have charity towards your enemies, and when they slap you on one, on one face, on one cheek, offer the other. Be an example, and especially, especially respond present to this call of conversion. Everything that truly comes from God, we invite you to go to confession. We'll invite you to go to communion. We'll invite you to receive baptism within the Roman Catholic Church. And we'll invite you to pray of the Holy Rosary, of the Via Crucis, of the Way of the Cross, like Marie Julie like Monique just explained a few moments ago. And please, please pray for Monique, her family, for Ron Ray and his family, for John Henry Weston, for Christine Bacon, for Michael Matt, and for all those um, courageous warriors that are there and have had the courage to raise themselves publicly, place themselves in a way in danger, in, uh, in the line of fire of criticism, pray for them all, and we will pray for you as well. And Monique, Indeed. thank you, as always, for being as outstanding as <laughs> you are, for representing so well uh, with Ron, uh, your, your lovely channel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I want to take one question. There is a question that has popped up in our chat right now that, well, since the beginning, about feeling abandoned by our priests. I, I think it might be appropriate, Gravier, for you to, 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 to let this person know, you know, what, what, where can they turn? If they feel abandoned by the church, they feel abandoned by their priests, their bishops, People don't know, you know, writing letters doesn't seem to work. Uh, you know, what, what do we do? That's a very good question. Um, look, if this happens, uh, my advice to you is this. Those of us who, I mean, I do not know very many people who haven't uh, gone through something like that. When your priest openly tries to discredit you, even in public, yes. and you feel abandoned, you do not know what to do. I've learned with the time, with years, to develop a crocodile skin. Learned indifference. Doesn't mean that you should condemn or feel animosity towards this priest. Pray for him. Believe me, of the two of you, he is the one who, in, who is in most need. He probably will make you feel bad. He will probably feel, make you feel abandoned. But you are not the one uh, who is being abandoned. He is placing himself outside the spirit of Christ, the spirit of our church. The problem is he doesn't know it. Don't feel so much as a um, judged party, but feel yourself rather as an observer. And whenever you see somebody like that priest falter, feel pity for him because he, has, he will have a great deal to answer for, for, for his guilty to make you feel in that way. Pray for him and continue. If you don't like this particular priest, if he makes you feel that badly, my invitation would be simply simply receive communion from him, avoid conversation, and seek another one in another parish, go to confession, explain to your con the new confessor what you went through, 
and listen to what he will tell you. Surely he will be inspired and you will be able to find another priest who will guide you through the straight path. But don't lose courage. That's what the enemy wants you to do. Don't collaborate. Stand up straight. Put up your shield. Get your sword out of your scupper and say, Christ is Lord and Mary is Queen. And you will be victorious. That would be, that's very theatrical, but it's a good piece of advice. <laughs> Thank you so much, Xavier, once again for an amazing episode. We're so grateful to have you. Such, And I, I remind everyone, again, please get this book, Revelations. Put it on your Christmas list. It's well, well worth it. No other book has these, sec these secrets that were hidden by the Vatican. So by all means, go and get yourself a copy. And um, next week, we will be discussing... Um, the prophecies about catastrophic natural disasters, curious spots in the sun, signs in the sky, and more. So please join us again next Monday. And uh, Xavier, would you help us con conclude with the St. Michael prayer? One, thank you. I'd love to. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, Defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and the snares of the devil. May God protect us, we humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl around the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Xavier, and thank you to all you out there who are watching our episodes. I hope you learn so much from it. You get the book and learn, study this. It's, it's, it's what's coming, and share it with others. Well, God bless you, everyone, and we will see you next week. God bless. Thank you.